Uh, okay, hey everyone. So today I'm going to present um, a paper that I find very interesting that has been gaining like so much steam recently. Um, I think it's probably considered the prominent approach when it comes to um, fine tuning um, large language models. The paper's name obviously is uh, LoRa, low rank adaptation of large language models. But um, before we jump in into how LoRa exactly works, uh, we should take a step back and um, start from the very beginning. So foundation models, what are they? Um, so recently there has been this trend where um, we were training very, very large models on huge amounts of data uh, in a self-supervised uh, fashion. Um, these models are normally like um, trained on very generic objectives uh, that are actually summarized very well in this um, screenshot I took from one of Jan Lacun's presentations. So normally we would, um, like these objectives could be um, perfectly described with the fill in the blanks. Um, like you, the model would try to predict um, a frame uh, based on the uh, the frame surrounding it, like in the video, or try to predict a word or a token based on the context, or a patch in an image. And um, the interesting thing about this is that when these models get bigger, um, even though they're trained on like a very generic objective, like they're not expl explicitly trained on a specific task, um, they end they end up having what the deep learning folks would call emergent behaviors. So they are able to perform relatively well or like decently on various tasks without being explicitly programmed to um, or explicitly trained to um, do these tasks. Um, like for example, if you get GPT-3 and you give it this prompt, it will be able to basically translate cheese to French. Um, I guess it's pronounced fromage. I'm not sure, I don't wanna butcher the, the accent. But uh, yeah, that's uh, something that's quite surprising and interesting at the same time. Um, so normally we take these foundation models and we start um, fine tuning them to um, specific downstream tasks. And I guess this sheds some light to the um, reasoning behind the naming foundation models. So it's like you have this base that you're building upon or like, yeah, basically building upon. Uh, and this takes us to the next phase, which is uh, fine tuning. So traditionally, how would you uh, go about that? So you would normally have a large language model. And again, I'm, I'm saying a large language model, but this like applies to any kind of foundation model that's not necessarily trained on uh, natural language text because I've been trained on images or videos or whatever. But the point is like we used to uh, fine tune these models by training all of the parameters um, for each downstream task. So you'd end up with, like if you have three downstream tasks, you'd end up with three uh, models. And this used to be okay uh, in the past. Like a few years ago, this was fine. The models weren't that big. I mean, they were big, but uh, like nowhere compared to what we have now. For example, I think the biggest birth is like 1.3 gigabytes. So it's, it was more like manageable inconvenience. But uh, at the moment, you have like GPT-3, for, for example, like is 175 billion parameters. Um, it's like hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, and it's just not feasible to have this many copies of the same model um, for the different Dustin tasks. It just, you can do that. And um, it's not just about having um, the copies, like it's not just like, yeah, having the copies of the model in training, especially when you're using um, adaptive optimizers, like Adam, for example, uh, most of the memory footprints actually comes from the optimizer, not the model itself. Because for example, Adam keeps two, um, like two numbers for each parameter. So the optimizer state would is literally like two models. So like even training this, fine-tuning it is, is quite expensive. If, even if you're going to create one single um, uh, fine-tuned large language model, it's 
still super expensive to, to do that. And this, this leads to uh, a new line of research that's more concerned about how we can um, efficiently train these large language models. Um, and that's called parameter efficient fine tuning, which is which Laura is obviously uh, part of. So what's parameter efficient fine tuning? So there are basically two famous approaches to efficiently fine tuning um, these foundation models. So the first one would be the um, adapter methods. In an adapter method, so this is the transformer block. I've excluded the residual uh, connections because I couldn't draw them, but just pretend they're there. Uh, be, like before every uh, layer norm layer, there's um, a residual connection, basically. Obviously, the, the blocks are, or the layers are the multi-head self-attention, um, fully connected layers, and there's the LN is the layer norm, the fully connected layers. So in the adapter method, we basically add some adapter layers um, before the layer norm. The adapter layers are basically um, like um, a fully connected layer plus a nonlinearity, then a fully connected layer. Um, they are normally, they don't have much, like many parameters compared to the entire model, and that's basically the point. And we basically just train these adapter layers and freeze the entire model. Like only the adapter layers are um, trained. So that's one way um, that we can train these foundation models uh, without having to train the entire thing. The other famous technique is from tuning, which Jonathan had a very nice session on um, two weeks ago. And in prompt tuning, you basically freeze the entire model as well. But um, instead of adding ad uh, adapter layers, you basically either prefix or prepend the input with a soft prompt or append it with a soft prompt, which are basically like free vectors or tokens that are learnable. So they are learned during training. And these are the, are the only trainable parameters in your entire pipeline. Everything else is frozen. And yeah, these two are the most um, prominent or most famous um, techniques when it comes to uh, parameter efficient uh, fine tuning. Um, so let's discuss their shortcomings. So adapter methods, obviously you're adding more layers. So adding more layers means inference is going on, this is gonna take more time. So that's one issue with adapter methods. And when it comes to prompt tuning, um, reserve, like when you reserve some of the sequence length for obviously the, the, the learnable tokens, then you're essentially reducing the um, available sequence length. So that's an issue as well. You're not able to utilize the entire sequence length. So these are two issues that we face when using uh, these methods. So a logical question would be, can we have like some kind of technique that has zero additional inference latency without compromising the sequence length? Um, because prompt tuning basically doesn't um, reduce the inference time, um, but it reduces the sequence length and adapter methods are the opposite. They increase the inference latency, but um, the sequence length is untouched. So is there a way we could have the best of both worlds? Well, let's start from the very beginning one last time, but um, before I continue, is there like any questions so far? Uh, yes, I have one. Sure. Uh, can't we just uh, like fine tune the last fully connected layer instead of adding one other more adapter layer? Yeah, that's a good question. And I was thinking about it. So I think the main reason why you wouldn't want to change um, or fine tune the last layers is that you don't want to play, like tamper with the model itself. You want to make sure that um, like if we fine tune the, 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 the final few layers and you had several downstream tasks, you will end up creating um, a copy of the model for each task. And we're trying to avoid this in the first place. You don't want to make um, several copies of the model. And um, the other reason that I, I think is also valid is that you don't want to change the base model itself. You want to build upon it. So you want the representation coming out of it to be used um, somewhere else without like playing with its 
spam their Slack. Do you get my point? Yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah, so, so essentially, like if you change the, 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 the last few fully connected layers and you have several downstream tasks, you will probably have to either create several models or um, you will have to like cut off the final layers and replicate them. And that way you're kind of like, like um, you kind of reduced the actual model size and you played with it, like you tempered with its weights. So basically, um, we we we, uh, we choose modularity over the like we choose the modularity of the model and the adapter layers over the the inference speed of or the efficiency of training the fully connected layers directly, but losing the ability to reuse them anywhere else. Using losing the ability to use the like, I don't get your point here. Uh, like losing the ability to use the the fine-tuned uh, parameters anywhere else, or or uh, merging it with, with another foundational model, if there if there are yeah, any. basically yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you okay, can't thanks. use it for other downstream tasks. Yeah. Um, is there any question before I move forward? Oh, I guess that's a no. Um, yep, so. Let's start from the be very beginning once again. So Neural Networks 101. Um, so this is the update rule for Neural Networks. Normally, we update the weights by adding some change uh, of weights that's calculated using the gradient. We basically multiply it with um, a negative um, step size or learn grade. So we don't take um, aggressive steps. This is all like literally neural networks 101 and everyone knows that but um something that that we're going to do that might seem super useless but i promise you is going to be it's going to make sense later is um so essentially in when, when we when we train neural networks what we're essentially doing is we have our original weights and we're adding some matrix to it. like at the very end what happened is that we had some random weights if we're training from scratch or if we are pre, uh, if we're fine tuning, then we have the uh, the pre-trained weights, and we're adding some uh, matrix. We do it uh, like in an iterative manner, but but we could do it like at once. We could do it, however. But the point is, we're adding a matrix to the um, to the original weights. So we could do something like this instead of having um, the neural network's original weights as a trainable parameter. Here, blue means it's trainable. We could freeze it and we could just learn the change of weights that we're supposed to add um this slide is super important so if there's any questions you guys should probably ask um this is literally equivalent like there's nothing um different about this except the way we are uh presenting the same thing we're just presenting it differently but it's the same thing essentially and this is the forward pass which is like um the difference between the forward pass in both um um perspectives i guess um so again like is there any questions with this one with this part like, like, i get you, that they are mathematically equivalent but how are they com computationally equivalent exactly like they're not computationally ex uh, equivalent in fact the second part is less is less efficient because you're doing um like additional computation and that's why this might seem useless. Like, why would you, anyone want to um, do this? Like, it doesn't make sense. It's computationally inefficient. It adds more latency. So there's no point in doing this. Or is there? Um, that's where LoRa comes in. So the LoRa hypothesis says the following: that the matrix that we are adding to the original weights does not have to be for rank. In other words, we can approximate it with um, two smaller matrices, like way smaller matrices. So essentially, we could say that the change of weights that we're supposed to add for our specific downstream task can be the multiplication of two matrices, B and A, um, that have um, this R rank, uh, this R dimension, which is way, way smaller than the original matrix. So this would look something like this, something like this, yeah. So. We're basically approximating this to this. And 
this is the new forward pass. So basically what we've done, we decomposed the delta W matrix into A and B, um, where A and B are way smaller than delta W. Um, can you guys see how this happened? Or like, is there something that you guys missed? Uh, um, is there any specifics about how this was decomposed? Like, or um, not really. It? You literally chose choose like. Um, how do you go back? Okay, there we go. You literally just choose a very low R, and you right. basically initialize um, the A with normal uh, Gaussian from Gaussian distribution from normal distribution, and you um, initialize B with zeros. So essentially, the first pass would be like A is initialized with normal noise, ah, right. uh, yeah, and B is zero, so yeah. it's basically zero. And, yeah. and then it's it, you, yeah. you basically train the A and B matrices. And the question is, so how does this reparameterization uh, re reduce the number of parameters? So like in a typical bird transformer, for example, um, the WQ is basically the matrix that projects um, the inputs into the queries. It's like 768 by 768. If we choose a low R, say eight, then A will be seven, six, eight by eight, and B will be eight by seven, six, eight. We'll be training essentially just like 12K parameters instead of training the almost 600 million, uh, 600,000 parameters. Like we're only training 2% of the original numbers, number of parameters. And that's where, um, that's basically the Laura magic. Um, I guess a very valid question would be uh, like, does this work and why does it work? And why does even any kind of uh, parameter efficient fine tuning technique works. Um, the Lloyd paper doesn't really discuss why this exactly works. It's an extension to a previous paper that's called um, Intrinsic Dimensionality Explains the Effectiveness of Language Model Fine Tuning. And like this previous paper really does dive into this a bit. But Laura itself, like the Lloyd paper, doesn't really um, mention it that much. But again, like from an intuitive level, you could always think about it in that way that. These large language models, they have they've been trained on like tons and tons of data. Um, so like they have so much knowledge in them and most of the downstream tasks, like there's already there's already the knowledge needed to kind of um, I wouldn't say do these tasks perfectly, but there's enough knowledge that only a subset of the parameters or maybe like um, a lower dimensional subspace of these parameters is um, is, is only needed to be tuned. Um, for these tasks to be done um, very well, I guess. So in some sense, it's, it's intuitive why very low number of parameters is, like, is enough, I guess, because these models, again, have so much knowledge already. Um, obviously, something like this wouldn't work if, you're, if you have a, a randomly initialized transformer, no matter how big it is. In fact, it wouldn't even work if you're like training on a on data that's from a completely different domain to the data that was that the model was pre-trained on. So that like let's say um, hypothetically that you had some giant transformer that was trained on medical data and you want to fine-tune it on some text that has to do with low, maybe. So setting a very small R here wouldn't really help. But if you're like within the same domain, then yeah. Small number of parameters is, is needed just for the for, for the fine tuning. Um, yep. So let's keep going. So yeah, we said that we wanted yeah, to technique that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just a question. Yes. Um, is there a particular yeah. reason to divide the change of weights matrix into two sub matrices instead of decomposing further into multiple matrices of smaller rank potentially? Yeah, interesting question. I haven't. I don't think they discussed this in the paper. Um, not sure, but uh, yeah, don't really see. Um, I guess it just maybe at a certain point it hits performance too much that it doesn't become worth it or something. I'm not quite sure really. Um, I don't know. I mean, th there has to be a drawback to decomposing the matrix into two sub matrices. If you train a lower, uh, on a lower amount of parameters, you have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to. Yeah, we'll get to the results, and you'll probably be impressed. But again, the point is, um, like, fine-tuning fine -tuning the entire model will definitely be um, better, and actually, like, quote-unquote better, 
because it's it easily overfits when you're using the entire um, number yeah. of parameters. So in some sense, sometimes LoRa and the other parameter efficient techniques like score better than fine tuning the entire thing because you, normally when you fine tune, you're fine tuning in, in a very small data set that contains like hundreds of thousands or thousands of of examples. Yeah. It, it just so you can easily overfit. So. Right. Yeah, so like, yeah, it, it isn't always the case that having more parameters leads to better performance because, yes. again, overfitting just is lurking around. Um, yeah, um, good question about that. So again, yeah, uh, we mentioned that we want something that has uh, no additional inference latency and the sequence length is um, is not compromised. So I guess it's obvious that we haven't played with the, with the sequence length at all. But if we look at the at the new uh, reparameterization, there's additional computations going on here. So there's definitely inference latency. So what's the story about this? And can we like get rid of this? Uh, absolutely. Once training is done, uh, we can simply like we've, we're done training. We can simply just merge the A and Bs into the original um, change of weight matrix, and we can just add it, add it to the um, the original weights, and that's it. You have a model that's trained for the downstream task. No compromises are done to the sequence length. The inference time is have, hasn't changed, and um, that's how it is. Basically, this is literally lower in a nutshell. Uh, is there any questions before we proceed? Like, does this make sense? How we got to this um, model with uh, no additional inference latency? I think I've heard. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you can get. You guys can just like open the mic without raising your hands. Okay. Uh, will Will the paper or the presentation contain uh, benchmarks for different uh, decomposition yep. ranks? Um. Yeah, it does. Um, okay. I don't. I don't know if I included that, but yeah, it does. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we'll get. We'll get. We'll get there. But so far, everything is fine. Like, is there any questions? It doesn't have to be on this point, like even in, on previous things. Yeah. All good. Um, OK, let's move on. So the benefits of LoRa in a, in a nutshell, like obviously the huge memory savings when using, especially when using adaptive, adaptive optimizers, uh, optimizers like ADA, um, as well as super few, like uh, as well as the super small model checkpoints. So basically, if you have like, three different downstream tasks, all you have to save are the A and B matrices. You don't have to save the entire model. And uh, whenever you want to switch between the tasks, you would just add, like, you would multiply the A and B matrices and add them to the um, uh, to the weights. And if you want to change the task, you would subtract, subtract them and then add the other uh, A and B uh, matrices. So this is quite uh, efficient. Instead of, like, saving the, the, the entire model, you're just saving a few megabytes. Um, there's the zero additional uh, inference latency when merging the AMB matrices back into the original weights as, um, as shown here. And there's no reduction in the model sequence length. Um, obviously, fast training as the gradients are calculated, we have um, the parameters that require gradients are like way, way less. And this is also an interesting point is that LoRa is orthogonal to most uh, parameter efficient fine tuning uh, methods. In, in other words, you could use it with um, like um, from tuning, for example, it's fine. It's orthogonal. Um, okay, so let's look at some results. So these are the results um, from um, the GLUE benchmark. So these are a bunch of NLP data sets. So for example, SS2 T2 is like a binary classification um, data set. I think all is similar, um, I believe. Um, MNLI, MNLI, which is, I forgot what, what it meant, but it's, it probably has to do with sentence matching, I believe. So these are different um, fine tuning techniques. So the first FT is basically, this is full fine tuning. Um, the model is Roberta. Um, so, yeah, as you guys can see, Laura probably like does so well on most of these uh, benchmarks, if not, better sometimes. Um, the uh, bit fit, this one is basically um, um, fine tuning the, the, bi the bias parameters only. It's like a baseline. The uh, 
ADPT is basically, basically adapter methods. And yep, uh, there's also these results. Uh, actually, I kind of forgot what R they were using in this one. But like you can, yeah, not sure which one. Um, it, it, this definitely uh, continued the paper. Um, these also are some other results. Um, in the Laura is doing pretty good. I, I normally take these uh, results with with a grain of salt, grain of salt, but yeah, interpret however you want. Uh, there's this uh, fine tuning top two. This is basically, basically just fine tuning the the topmost uh, the topmost layers. Yeah, the two topmost layers. Pre layer is basically uh, from tuning. And yep. What else? Yeah, there's this chart which is quite interesting. Um, so this is the, like on the x-axis we have the trainable number of trainable parameters and the validation accuracy. Um, it's interesting that if you look at like methods like prefix embedding, uh, prefix embed is basically prompt tuning, and prefix layer is like an extension of prefix embedding, uh, prompt tuning, where like it's, it happens on every layer instead of the first layer. And the adapter method, it's like, when the number of parameters increases, um, it's not necessarily the case that the accuracy uh, increases. And the paper does point out that this is an interesting phenomenon that's not studied properly, but they um, speculate that the reason that this is happening is that when you add more free vectors to the prompt, you're basically shifting the distribution that the transformer was trained on. This might explain why the performance kind of gets worse. But looking at LoRa, um, it's super stable, I guess, uh, across the different uh, trainable parameters, the number of trainable parameters as well in, in both um, benchmarks. And like, if you look at it, it almost um, has the same uh, performance as full, fully fine tuning the model. This is GPT-3 model, by the way. Uh, actually, the bigger the model, the you can use um, a lower number, a lower R basically. So you would have smaller A and B matrices and you're basically fine tuning a lesser number of parameters, which also makes sense. Because the bigger model, model probably has like more uh, knowledge. So you don't have to fine tune as much uh, parameters as, as many parameters. Um, some interesting insights from the paper and final thoughts. So there's this uh, statement they had. Oops. But they were able to um, reduce the, the training uh, memory footprint from 1.2 terabytes to 350 gigabytes. Um, again, most of the memory footprint comes from the optimizer. And they were using R equals 4. Actually, we have a very interesting result where they set R to 1 while fine tuning a GPT 3 model, and it had like very, very good um, accuracy. Uh, which was interesting. Um, there's also this question that they ask in the paper, which weight matrices should we apply lower to in uh, a transformer block? So in this table, they're basically um, applying lower to the um, uh, query weights or the key or the values or both key and Q and K or Q, K, V and the uh, output projection weights. And like the conclusion is if you're um, if you can't really change all of the weights, like you don't want to apply lower to them and you're like tight on your budget, you could just um, apply lower to the, um, the query weights and the, and the value weights and it will probably give very decent results. Um, so uh, an obvious question would be what's the best R? Like how would you choose it? Um, R is basically a hyperparameter that you'll probably manually tune. Like there's no off the shelf best R. There isn't any way to, to predict it, I guess. You would have to play around with this. But obviously the higher R, the bigger the A and B matrices get and the more parameters you're going to uh, fine tune, which leads to more a more complex model and uh, the possibility of overfitting. 
while lower R has the uh, obvious opposite effect. Um, this is mostly what lower is. So yeah, thanks everyone for listening. If there's any question, I'll be happy to, to answer.